I think it might be time for the Q and A. Um, so I'm really keen to hear from some of these young faces at the front. Uh, my name's Kieran. What do you think the best response that someone can give to a racist experience? Does anyone want to take that? Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you have to ask such a tough question right at the beginning? <laughs> um, to continue to be you. Um, to... to never doubt yourself. So I'm taking this away now from some of what you've said because the reason people do that is because they want to take away who you are as a human being. The reason people racially abuse is because, or discriminate in any kind of whatever characteristic is because they want to take, they want to de the term dehumanize. They want, to, they want to strip you of your identity and to be able to rise above that is a really difficult thing. So there's not one way to answer this question, to be totally honest, because it's 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 tougher than any Jay's question. So you should actually sit in his spot. <laughs> um, it, it, it's more about knowing who you are as a human being, getting the opinion of your, your colleagues, um, getting the support from your colleagues, seeking that support, seeking the, the, the advice, because Listen, let me talk about myself. I know when I was young and when someone racially abused me, I started to scratch my skin. Why was I scratching my skin? Because I wanted to see if I was white underneath. I wanted to be like the person that was racially abusing me. I no longer want to be like the people who abuse me because I know who I am. I know my identity. I know what I stand for. And that might be difficult in one so young, but I think just reaffirming who you are as a person, yeah, is, is the most important thing. So that's almost that self kind of, no, I know I am. I know why I'm here. If it's on a football pitch, I know why I'm on the football pitch. You know, so for me, it's, geez, I'm, I'm not even sure I've done the question justice, to be totally honest, but it's the first thing that actually comes to my mind. Can I just add to that, yeah. Um So for me, I think the, oh, sorry. I think in addition to all of the stuff Troy's already said, I think it's also not being afraid to be emotional about it. So I think if I think of the landscape of football, or again, let's not even make it football. If I think about myself, I like to think of myself as like someone who's like quite hard. I don't really like cry. I don't really get emotional. I'm like, I'm generally quite okay. But actually post Euros final, I was racially abused. And actually I remember the mental process of, I need to get my head in the game as it relates to work because I have a job. But actually, I, I needed to just cry too. And actually, sometimes it's okay to just have that emotion, whatever that is, to dance in a changing room, to cry in your bedroom, to call your mum, to do whatever it is you need to do, and then figure out how you're going to process. So I think in addition to all of what Troy said, I think it's, it's also being willing to be vulnerable in whatever way helps you to express your emotions. Yeah, I agree with that, because I think when it happens to you, you're going to feel a different range of emotions. People feel differently. You know, but I think you'll feel an anger emotion because I think whenever I've been kind of, you know, racially victimized, wherever it be in a shop or whatever it might be, I have that feeling of anger. And then I think don't react, Leanne, in that way because they want you to react that way. But I think it's important to allow yourself to feel, you know, as we've mentioned before, and never be silent. I think in this day and age now, you can actually express how you feel. And I think that's really impactful. But feel whatever emotion you need to feel. Crying, the anger, that feeling you get, that feeling that you feel sick in your stomach when it happens to you because it's a feeling you can't explain, isn't it? It's, it's just something that you can't explain until you go through it. Um, I'll, I'll chip in at this point. How old are you, Kieran, sorry? Um, 13. 13. So um, when I was, I think, nine years old, I actually moved school because of the comments I was getting on the playground. And... Um, no, it was a really disheartening thing to do. I had so many friends. It was a really a tricky period. But I think people were just trying to knock for the fact that I was different. And I think over time, I've just become more and more proud of my culture. And I think obviously because I am quite a light-skinned person, I used to get a lot of comments from people saying, well, you're not really a black man, are you? Or you're, you know? And I think it was just about people just trying to pick up anything to try and chip my confidence away. And a lot of the time, it's because they're, they're fearful of what we can do and they're jealous of what we can do. And I think that's something that you should always remember. That people are just trying to knock for who you are, you should be proud of that, do you know what I mean? That, that's one thing I'd say to you. Yeah, just to 
finish off what he was saying. You guys are 13, Kieran, so we're probably at that age where you just start in high school, going from the top dogs in the little school to the babies in the big <laughs> school. Um, and I'm trying to think back at your age, so growing up where I grew up in Liverpool, lost the accent a bit now. Um, <laughs> I My reaction then would be totally different as a young 13-year-old as I am now as a 23-year-old. Um, <laughs> you know, so I'll come back to you. But you know, and but and you shouldn't feel that yours has to be a certain way. So I think we've said earlier. I think it was Leanne. My m reaction might be different to Leanne's. Might be different to Troy's. Might be different to Edeline's. It's being your authentic self, absolutely, and find that mechanism to get support. I think that's universal to get your support uh, from friends, teachers, authorities, whatever it is. But um, but again, absolutely, don't be afraid to let all that out because we're all speaking from a place of actually deep trauma because we're all recounting these stories that you've suppressed most of the time because at the time they happened you probably just kept them inside from on the football pitch and where going on from school or whatever you kept them inside so we're all talking at that listen my wife tells me all the time I'm a nightmare I don't say anything and just keep it all to myself not healthy not healthy so just make sure you've got that outlet got any other questions oh plenty ample hands now I don't know who's got the do you want to I'm sure we can just pass it along afterwards. I'm Rhea and from UCL Academy. How did you feel after the Euros and how everything was dealt with? Go on, go on. Say your name's Rhea. That's Yeah, post Euros was tough. Um, I think <coughs> it was what on a personal level, as somebody newer to, to football. Um, I think it was a tough time for the industry. I think across all of our different organisations and authorities, we were figuring out how we make sure, first and foremost, we support those individual players so that they knew they had football behind them, that they had any, necessarily out, any necessary outlets that they might need. Um, I think for those of us who have also been working on projects like social media abuse, it was straight on the phone to social media organisations. Um, and probably some angry conversations, to, to Leanne's point, um, and trying to hold them to account. Um, there were conversations from our standpoint with government straight after that. So it was an intense period of time. But I think it was also really positive in the sense that we were able to see society getting behind those three individuals and recognising that shift that we've talked about where people became aware of incidents that they maybe didn't before. So if I think of my parents who are in their 70s and are not really engaging with social media or Instagram or Facebook or Twitter or any of those things, it was the first time that they were having conversations about, gosh, isn't it awful what these social media platforms are enabling to happen to these three individuals who have just played a game and done their day job and then receive thousands of pieces of abuse. So I think it was a moment of awareness. I think it was incredibly tough for the three individuals, the players and the broader team and Gareth as the manager. Um, I think it was also really difficult across the entirety of football because everybody just had the welfare of those individuals at the forefront of the mind. And it was figuring out the best way to do that whilst doing all of the things that need to happen in the background in terms of you know, getting evidence, getting statements, getting through so people can be arrested, can be charged, can lead to prosecution, et cetera, et cetera. So, yeah, the word I used to describe that that week for me is intense. I'm not sure if anybody else wants to chip in. No, I think... Yeah, yeah. Uh, all, all I'd say is that it enabled us as, a, as, a, as an organisation to come down a little bit so we had tighter, tighter punishments for people found abuse in, in the stadium. Um, they had world, um, worldwide stadium wild bands throughout the Premier League, not just that club. We had we worked, did some work and hand steward training, so stewards are often in the front line of some of this some of this abuse that if it comes from the crowd. Fans and people feel more confident to approach stewards, and obviously we've doubled down on our uh, education as well. So a month, um, you know, following that really difficult moment, not least for the guys, you know, let's not forget Bakayo and the guys themselves. Following that really difficult moment, it enabled us to just ratchet up the, some of the punishments. And what and we saw yesterday and with the main Sawyers a few weeks ago, actually custodial sentences now, potentially. And that's, and that's made it, that's set a precedent. So judges now can say, found guilty, eight, eight weeks in prison, 10 weeks in prison. That starts to turn the dial as well. What's the next question? Hi, my name's Elsa and I'm from the UCL Academy. 
What are the most effective forms of punishment for racism in football? Oh, this is a good question here. But it's an open forum, so. <sighs> Why am I put on the spot? Uh, international football expulsion. So it means that any country that has a reputation in this space uh, cannot play in World Cup tournaments, cannot play in European tournaments. We've done the little fines. We've done the slap on wrists. It's expulsions. Um, for me, and that's we're nowhere near that at the moment because the law, the, whatever the ruling, doesn't allow for that. So they'll continue to have a partial stadium closure, which then moves those fans around to another part of the stadium where they can still abuse. We've seen the Hungarians recently abuse in, in two competitions, not just the World Cup, but also in European football, European uh, UEFA football, and yet still get punishments because UEFA don't, do what FIFA do, so their FIFA punishment is not for you. Am I confusing you? Because oh, I'm confused. <laughs> so, you know, it's just it, it's just not. We need a better joined up approach, and the authorities that lead that UEFA FIFA at the top of our game should be then informing all uh, bodies throughout right across the game of football that that is going to be our approach. Now, people will say, well, you can't, you know, for fa just because fans, you can't. Well, you can. Because football clubs, that, that's their fan base. You know, so if it means that we deduct points, if it means that you know, a, a history of a football club, starting from whenever we decide, is defined by whatever their fans are doing, and if their fans continue to be... I think we're fortunate in the Premier League that we say we don't really see it. We see it, but it's dealt with. But again, I'm just going to focus on down the leagues. And there's far too many people getting away with, with uh, discriminatory abuse, in our system that shouldn't that shouldn't be allowed. I would I would say that sorry Pete. Um, I think a lot of these big organisations are not proactive enough. I think they react when something happens and obviously I don't think anybody expected the backlash from the Euros in the way that we did. But I do think that also there's another thing to be said about FIFA and UEFA. There's nobody really there that's like us. So it's almost like how can you really give an opinion unless you've really been through something? And I think that Thankfully, now in football, you know, there's more black coaches, there's more people from ethnic minorities. But I still think at the big organisations that are making these decisions, as Troy said, they are slaps on the wrist. And you can't generalise a whole country and say everybody in Hungary is racist. But they got banned in Hungary, but they came to Wembley. And we were surprised that they came to Wembley, held up a, a banner with you know, the big X's through taking a knee. Why were we surprised in that? And then, then they want to react. And I do think they need to be banned from competitions. And I do think, you know, heavy, heavy punishments have to happen because then nothing is changing in the world. I, I think the only thing I would um, add in addition to, to what's all so been said is we have to be open and honest about the fact that sometimes our own fans here on home soil do not behave in appropriate ways, right? And I think... You know, people will have seen we've recently had a charge from a Wembley perspective post the Euros final. And that wasn't because of Hungarian fans or Ukrainian fans or Polish fans or Spanish fans or anybody else. That was our own fans. And so I think there's a huge job that we also have to continue to do to educate our own fans. Otherwise, to Troy's point, we could be in a position where we're also outside of, of international football and that's not what we want. So I think it is recognising and understanding those broader shifts that we need, not just across our community and our society, but indeed globally as well. By the way, we've got time for one more question after this. Yeah. Le Leanne nicked a bit of my lunch Sorry. there. So um, <laughs> in the nicest possible way, that's what I was gonna, that was the point I was going to make. And, uh, also a lot of the organisations in terms of UEFA and FIFA don't look even like this room, unfortunately. So that lived experience they don't have. Um, and I say that because whatever we to do now, we've got a programme in terms of our number of information around exec pathways, trying to make those pathways because we know what the game looks like off the pitch compared to what it looks like on the pitch. And we know there's big challenges to, to affect some of that, both in coaching and the boardroom. So we've got to start somewhere, but unfortunately that's a low base. And what it means is that in those corridors of power, that really isn't owned as a piece of work to make sure that punishment is as stringent and as strong as it needs to be. That's going to take some time, but it may, I think it's up to all of us and to pe put pressure on those of us who, who, who feel and want to affect it to make sure that the, that, that, part of the, that part of the equation is done as well. 
okay, we look at punishment, but who's who's laying down the punishment? What do they look like? Are they diverse enough? Because that's that that's a massive part of the issue as well. One more question. I'm gonna let one of you. I'm gonna put use teachers on the spot and say one of you guys have got to decide. They have to go back because they hold the grudge again. <laughs> well, maybe they can ask a few more. Maybe one of us answers. That might be yeah. helpful. Yeah. Did you just do you just no, put no, yourself I'll, forward for answering? No, no. But you know what <laughs> I mean. Like yeah. We, the, the kids yeah, yeah. have got their questions. So maybe if one they, of us answers instead they of they don't want to hear from me. They want to hear from you guys. <laughs> My name is Callum Uchikin from UCL Academy. Uh, and my question is, um, would you ever think of racism as jealousy? I'm not even going to answer. I'm going to try and answer. What a magnificent question. Um, so historically, and I'm not going to give a big history lesson. So if you look at something like slavery, that started off as an economic thing. So it was a trade, and then the um, use um, a, a disposable, and I'll use that word right, labor in West Africa. So it started off as an as a economic thing, but to perpetuate that economic and, and secure your, your position at the top of the table economically, you had to make, um, and you hear this with some arguments about eugenics, about the fact that these people weren't quite human, that kind of thing. So that's the justification for slavery and some of the ramifications of that from 200, 300 years later are still in place. And you can see that sometimes, particularly in the States, I think, around some of the conversations. That's a really, really potted version of, of, of some, of, of, I think, if of, you of understand the question. It's not so much jealousy, I think, it's the, it's the need to make other people feel like others and less than, less than human to justify uh, an economic uh, um, power, if that makes sense, a little bit. Still got time for a couple more? Or? Got one more, one more question. One more, one more. Make it long. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that, I, I, did, I did the exact same thing. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you the question. <laughs> Uh, my name is Hayden, and I'm 13 years old from the Yusukel Academy. But this question is for Keaton, ma mainly. Um, what do you think you would do? Um, what do you think Freddie would do if he didn't have his teammates' um, support and they were against him? Um. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think Freddie, based on his past actions, he would have tried to get attention from everybody else around him without trying to put himself in the spotlight, if that makes sense. So, um, he would have, he wouldn't have said what, what, what would have happened. Oh... Question. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> what about if it was you? If it was me, and my teammates were supporting me. If if my teammates were if my teammates weren't supporting me, um, I would have just known that this club wasn't right for me. So I would have just left the club and left it as that, and found somewhere else which people do support me. I think I think that's time. Yeah, I think that's time, everybody. So first and foremost, thank you all for coming down. Um, thanks again to the panel. Thanks again to uh, Sam and Joe for, for setting this all up. Hope you all enjoyed it. I hope it was a good conversation. I hope you all continue the conversations and I hope you all do well at school. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.